So tonight, friends, we're going to discuss what we may call the judicial machinery of the legal system. Uh, we will begin by examining the three important components of this machinery, that is the magistrates, the archons, and the elected officials. Uh, that is the first part, I should say, the, the magistrates, archons, and elected officials. The second part is the courts themselves. Uh, and then the third part is the private and public arbitrators. And in doing so, we can again see the importance the Athenians attached to law and their readiness to participate in the legal system, perhaps more so than their zeal to take part in the political life of the city. Now, the magistrates we've already met. Uh, in the Bronze Age period, justice, we learned, was dispensed by the kings and perhaps also by tribal elders. Uh, by the Archaic period, in the case of Athens, for example, the Areopagus had uh, control. Uh, of political and judicial life. Day-to-day -day administration was in the hands of annually elected archons who had a number of functions, uh, presumably the same ones that the kings used to have. And these magistrates would hear disputes themselves and decide the outcomes, but their arbitrary dispensation of justice was countered somewhat uh, once Solon introduced the court of appeal known as the Heliaia. Although the courts dispensed justice, no case came to court unless the appropriate magistrate said so. In other words, the magistrates, uh, the magistrates also had a role in the judicial process because they acted as a sort of middle stage or clearinghouse of indictments. If someone had a dispute or wanted to lay a charge against another person, uh, he would first approach the relevant magistrate to put forward his case. And we'll discuss the various types of suits uh, later on tonight. But the magistrate would then, at that point, decide whether the case had legal grounds or not. And if it did, he would then assign it to a court. If he thought the charge was dubious in any way, or if the matter was settled to the satisfaction of both parties, then the courts were not involved, uh, just like settling out of court nowadays. Sometimes the plaintiff might want to bypass the court system and use an arbitrator, and will come to arbitration shortly. But each of the archons had various political duties, as we know. And uh, we're not going to go into that. We've talked about those before. Tonight, we're only concerned with their judicial duties. Well, the archons were responsible for four different types of lawsuits, as the Athenian constitution tells us. And, and these suits included private and public offenses. So the Basileos archon, as we might expect, dealt with cases involving religion, which were mostly public ones. And these included charges of impiety, for example. Uh, if somebody had been attacked at a religious festival, uh, that would go under this. You, if you're familiar with uh, the writings of Plato, you'll know that Socrates uh, was brought up on the charge of impiety. And uh, the, the dialogue that is known as the Euthyphro takes place on the steps of the office, basically, of the Archon Basileos. These magistrates also uh, settled uh, disputes over the allocation of priesthoods. Um, disturbances at festivals were taken very seriously because the offense that uh, it was assumed would, uh, the, the, such an offense would, would offend the gods and uh, because violence of course was not supposed to happen at a festival. And then if the gods weren't happy, then uh, you know, all sorts of other ramifications for the city could take place, you know, famine, plague, uh, pestilence, uh, earthquakes, you name it. The Basileus Archon also had jurisdiction over any dispute involving a priest and over homicide suits that were brought by an individual um, against an alleged murderer, uh, or for that matter, by a victim's family against the alleged murderer. Again, to bring up the case of Socrates, uh, that dialogue, the Euthyphro, if you're familiar with it, or if you're not familiar with it, Socrates is talking with a young man named Euthyphro who is bringing a lawsuit against his own father because uh, his father has accidentally murdered a slave. And uh, Euthyphro was so possessed with an idea of righteousness and duty, eosabea, or piety, um, that uh, he is willing to bring a capital charge against his own father, which if, if found guilty, the father would be executed. So, um, and that is the backdrop for that very famous dialogue uh, between Socrates and this young man. <clears throat> 
Well, moving on to the next uh, archon, that is the eponymous archon, uh, he would have dealt with all family and private matters, uh, property matters, that is, such as inheritance, guardianship matters involving orphans and heiresses, any maltreatment of orphans and heiresses, um, insanity cases that involve squandering property, uh, whether someone had abused his parents or not buried his parents in accordance with the laws. Um, <clears throat> all of these things would have been uh, overseen by the eponymous archon. And that leaves the third archon, that is the, the polymarchus archon. And he dealt with private suits, not public ones at all. Um, what came before the polymarchus archon often involved medics, that is those resident aliens of Athens. And the Athenian constitution says that the polymarchus archon did for medics what the eponymous archon did for citizens. Okay, so there you have it. These cases could range from a medic committing a crime to inheritance matters involving a medic's estate. When a foreigner became an Athenian citizen, which was rare, but it did happen, he was supposed to have a sponsor who of course had to be a full citizen. And any foreigner who didn't have a sponsor or who abused his sponsor in some way was also under the jurisdiction of the Polymarchus Archon. Incidentally, having a sponsor was something like the equivalent today of sponsoring a family uh, member or somebody like that to move to join someone living in a foreign country. We do that if any of you are uh, have maybe firsthand experience with that sort of thing, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's very common for a person to, you know, once one of their family members has kind of gotten into the legal pathways towards becoming a citizen in America, they can then kind of summon their other uh, and be a sponsor to other people to then come over. Presumably a litigation uh, as it increased and as the archons had to deal with more claims, they found that they just couldn't cope with them all. There were simply only so many hours in the day after all, uh, and hence they delegated some judicial tasks to the six Thesmothetai. You remember that these Thesmothetai were sort of junior magistrates who may have begun as something like secretaries, as we talked about in an earlier lecture. And by the fourth century BC, they had judicial powers that included assigning the days on which the courts met and introducing various public and private cases to court. These included public ones, such as non-citizens masquerading as citizens, the graphe paranomon, which we talked about last time, uh, bribery and failure to register as a debtor. Those in debt to the state were denied various political and judicial rights until they discharged their debts. If they died before they could do so, the debt passed to their children. Private suits included mining and commercial ones where a slave had abused a free man and also perjury before the Areopagus. The Thesmothetai also introduced the Euthune. You remember that kind of scrutinizing or reckoning of public officials, elected officials at the end of their year in office. The Euthune um, was the scrutiny of a magistrate's year in office. And if he were found to have been corrupt or had to have not discharged his duties properly, he was not allowed to enter the Areopagus and he might even face criminal charges in a court of law. We don't know what form the Euthune took uh, you know, whether it was like a oral kind of thing, uh, he stood before a council or whether it was all through documents, we don't know, but it was a balance to the dokemasia, which was an, an inquiry into those putting themselves forward as candidates or for election to political office. So there was this other kind of thing, the dokemasia, where they had to give proof or show that they were a person of good standing. We know more about it because there are passages from a speech in the late fourth century uh, by an order named Dinarchus, who gives us some idea of the questions that were asked at the Dokimasia. And these were both technical and moral. So they included whether the candidate had legitimate children, whether he treated his parents well, whether he owned land in accordance with the laws, whether he had served in the army on campaign, or even if whether he had paid his taxes. Uh, most of these stipulations strike us as reasonable, and we often hear the same sorts of things, right, being trotted out today by candidates for political office. Up until the past president, it was always customary for uh, uh, politicians to reveal their tax returns, for instance, kind of the same sort of thing. Um, and this one question about owning land appears to be a little odd, but apparently it refers to someone who owns land or a house 
uh, obviously includes including a plot of land that he had acquired e uh, legally. Did he get his house legally? Presumably, if the candidate were found to have neglected some of these legal um, stipulations during his term in office, he might still fa fail his Ewuthune, and then he could be exiled or have something even worse happen to him. The Athenian legal system also had it in it magistrates who had special technical or professional titles given the job that they did. And these made them responsible for cases in their own particular areas. These were akin to public prosecutors, if you like. And they included officials who were in charge of trade and the marketplace. Uh, these men were called agora nomoi. So remember the agora means the marketplace and nomoi are, are the laws. So the, those who keep the laws of the marketplace. Then there were officials who were in charge of the grain supply. These were called the sitofulakes, the guardians of the grain. And these men were responsible for allegations of bad business practice. So for example, the sitofulakes were especially important given the reliance of Athens on imported grain from the Black Sea area. Uh, and of course, you know, bread, grain was the main staple food that everybody ate every single day. That was mostly what they ate. Then there were 10 strategoi or generals, and they dealt with cases that involved military crimes, as we might expect. Crimes such as throwing away your shield in battle, and that would be desertion, uh, which throwing away one shield in battle was the kind of like symbol of desertion because it was so heavy. You know, it would weigh something like 50 pounds or something like that, maybe a little bit less, 35 pounds, but this enormous thing. So if you wanted to run away, it would be the first thing you would, you would hurl. Um, they look also things like cowardice in battle or trying to get out of military duty, you know, claiming to have a bone spur or something like that. Um, all of these actions were indictable and if found guilty, the person accused of one of these crimes would lose his citizenship. There were also the 10 sunegaroi or public advocates who prosecuted a magistrate who had failed his Euthune. And they also prosecuted other public prosecutors who prosecuted those found guilty after an investigation by the Ecclesia or the Boule. So for example, under a, a charge known or a process known as an ace engalia, this is a procedure I'm gonna discuss later on. Um, uh, just hold on to that term. I, I mentioned before the, the 11 who were a type of police force that were also in charge of the prison. Uh, we don't know much about them, but um, what we do know is that the prerequisite was being uh, for, to be in charge of, of this. Uh, I'm sorry, the prerequisite was for being a member of the 11. And I would imagine a powerful, uh, you know, physical physique would also be a required thing to be part of the secret police. And no doubt people tried to resist arrest then as now. Well, since Athens was one of the larger polis in the classical period, it had literally hundreds of magistrates and officials to administer it. It also had a large number of courts, and that brings us to discuss the courts, uh, and that's what I'd like to do right now. We've already said a lot about the courts in our survey of the development of the legal code, but they were another part of the judicial machinery, and we need to make some comments on them right now. For the archaic and early classical periods, the Areopagus was responsible for the archons, I'm sorry, it was responsible with the archons for dispensing justice. But during the legislation, the radical reformation of, of Ephialtes in 462, which rendered the Areopagus largely impotent apart from certain judicial functions that we had mentioned last time. Um, uh, all of those judicial functions were the right to judge cases of premeditated homicide, wounding, arson, damage to the sacred olive trees, attempted tyranny or subversion of the constitution. Everything else, including the right to judge an official's conduct during his, his office, fell to the ecclesia and the boule, those two kind of the courts attached to them. The religious nature of homicide made it an especially heinous crime because it affected the gods. And until a homicide matter was resolved, the city was in a state of miasma or pollution. This is a very, interesting term. I think we've talked about it before. Miasma, it, it, is, we, it means ritualistic pollution. Um, it would mean that uh, no, any city that the, that the murderer was in would pollute it. Um, if you've read the play Oedipus Rex, you know that that is basically the whole premise of the whole play, 
that the murderer of the old king is polluting the city of Thebes and thereby causing a terrible plague to sweep through the city. Um, we use this word miasma nowadays in a kind of secular sense. You know, we might speak about, you know, the miasma of racism or something like that, you know, kind of like, um, you know, just something like, you know, a, a, a bad sort of, uh, you know, attitude or a sort of prevalent, a negative and a prevalent attitude or something like that. But it had this very distinctly religious connotation in ancient Greek. Um, it was necessary to lift this miasma as quickly and expeditiously as possible without causing further pollution. And so the type of habasaid spawned a number of different courts. And that is where there were five special courts to set up to try different types of homicide. And in all of these courts, apart from the Areopagus, the jurors all numbered 51. Uh, and we talked about that before. It was always the one, the odd number was always to avoid a tie. And I would just like to say a few words about these five courts now and the different types of homicide that came before them. Well, to begin with, there was the Areopagus, something of an old friend by now. And as we said, the Areopagus tried cases of premeditated homicide, and all of its members would judge these cases. The second court was that of the Palladion, which tried cases of unintentional homicide, uh, planning or, or acts of planning a homicide, um, but not actually committing it. Also for killing a medic that would be a resident alien or a, simply a foreigner traveling through the area or a slave. Then there was the court of the Delphinion, which tried cases of justified homicide. In Athenian law, <clears throat> justified homicide involves killing someone uh, in self-defense. Um, or um, if a person kills a, co a fellow competitor at, say, the Olympic Games, where there was a contest called the Pankration, uh, which was wrestling and boxing combined. And apparently the only rules for it was that you don't kill your opponent and you don't gouge his eyes out. Pretty much anything else but that biting or whatever was perfectly okay. So obviously it happened on some occasions that people died. And those kind of cases would be held here. Also under the justified homicide law was killing of an adulterer. A husband who caught his wife with another man could kill that adulterer, but there was not to be any premeditation about it. He had to catch the adulterer in flagrante delecto and, uh, and kill him kind of in passion, but he couldn't have tried to plan it out ahead of time. Justifiable homicide also covered anyone who killed a person trying to subvert the constitution, that is to uh, dissolve the democracy and make it into a tyranny. The fourth court was something called the Pritinion, which judged cases where the murderer was unidentified. When a suit was brought before the Pritinion, the unidentified murderer um, was simply referred to as the doer of the deed. The Pritinion also judged cases where an animal or an object had caused a death. For example, if a rock fell down or someone uh, on someone and killed that person, or if a horse bolted and <clears throat> ran someone over, killing that person, the, uh, these, these matters would be brought to this court. Today, a case like this would probably be handled as a coroner's inquiry, but back then, because someone had still been killed, blood had been shed in a violent manner, the gods were involved, and therefore the, the city had the religious duty to try that case and somehow kind of get to the bottom of exactly what happened. The fifth and final court was in the sanctuary of Freatus. This dealt with someone who was currently living in exile because he had been found guilty of homicide before, but while living in exile, he had, been, he, he had killed again. Uh, perhaps he killed an Athenian who was living abroad, or perhaps he killed an Athenian trader who was operating in some other polis or state and therefore not living in Athens. The murderer was now accused of another killing, and this person could defend himself against the new homicide charge, but he had to make his defense not in the actual sanctuary, which would have brought pollution, of course, but actually on a boat that was anchored off the coast of Freato this area, that's where it gets its name from. Um, and the defendant put forward his case from the boat so that he didn't set foot on attic soil because again, miasma. Uh, being found guilty of homicide before, if he did actually set his foot on attic soil, he would be polluting the land. So you see how incredibly seriously they took this idea, even though it seems, you know, uh, these practices might seem strange to us. 
Well, once trial by jury became the norm, all of the law courts became an important part of the Athenian constitution. They met regularly for over two thirds of the year. And each year a panel of 6,000 citizens was elected to the jury board and swore an oath to uphold the laws as we've talked about before. And what's interesting about the courts is that their location supposedly in the Agora of Athens is still unknown. There doesn't seem to have been a fixed building made of stone, which was the law court, like today, for example, where we can point to a building and say that's the Supreme Court, or there's the municipal court, or a court, or something like that. Not so in Athens. Very often in Athens, cases, cases were heard in other buildings, like the Odeum, which was built close to the Acropolis in the age of Pericles. These other buildings would be used for a variety of functions, just like today. We have sports stadiums that could be used for. Um, I don't know, gun shows or whatever, uh, or, you know, rock concerts. Uh, it was kind of like that back in classical Athens. There's, um, you know, they would have multi different things going on inside of these buildings. There's also a belief that the courts might have been portable structures in the sense that they could be easily erected and dismantled depending on the case. Uh, for some cases, as we know, we get very large juries, they can number in the four figures, and the lowest number would be 201. Uh, for some cases. So clearly, if you have a building with a fixed number of seats, then that building could accommodate that number. But if, you, um, if you're able to put together a movable thing with bleachers, um, then, uh, you know, put those together into an area or formation, you know, so that would, uh, you know, especially if it, these were all open air structures, so um, you didn't have to worry about ceilings or roofs or anything like that, then that would solve the problem where you, uh, when you had to have a jury of a very large number. Well, as we've talked about before, the jurors took their role seriously in the Constitution, even though the pay was measly. It had been uh, increased by Cleon in 424 to three obols a day, half a drachma, whereas an unskilled laborer at that time made one drachma a day, uh, made twice as much, that's, uh, that is. Uh, moreover, jury pay remained at this rate, three obols a day, even by the late fourth century. So 100 years after Cleon raised it, uh, it, it had remained the same. However, by then, that is by the late fourth century, ecclesia pay was three times greater at one and a half drachmas per day. Um, this different rate of pay has implications, I believe, for how the Athenians viewed their participation in civic life. Uh, that is, they valued the uh, value in, in, in law courts uh, less than the value in the um, in the political arena. And by extension, I think what they really wanted to do in the state. Uh, did higher assembly pay indicate that the assembly was a more important organ of the constitution? It did debate and decide all domestic and foreign policy. And so as a result, the people deserved a higher rate of pay for attending it. And that might make perfect sense. But on the other hand, you could actually make the argument that perhaps the higher rate of pay was to induce Athenians to attend the, um, the ecclesia, the assembly perhaps because there wasn't a, always a quorum. Maybe there wasn't enough people to do it. And since there was always a, a line of men at the law courts, then there was no need to raise jury pay because there was never any shortage of men waiting to do the job. So a really nice example, actually, of how ancient history is so different than modern history, where we know things with far greater certainty. Here, you know, so much has to be interpreted, argued over, uh, based on our oftentimes uh, very imperfect uh, data. We know that in the fifth century BC, a man carrying a, roped, a rope dipped in vermilion dye, that is red dye, would go into the agora, the marketplace, and there he would twirl his rope around, and whoever got hit by it would get a red mark on him. Those men who got those red marks would then have to go to the Penix to attend the assembly. And that indicates that the people were less thrilled, I think, at attending the assembly than being jurors. And as a result, they had to be coaxed to the assembly with greater pay. So I fall down on that second interpretation. The final pay of the judicial machinery, I'm sorry, the final part of the judicial machinery that I wish to discuss is the arbitrators. These people were extremely important in the constitution We've talked about the role of arbitrators in early Greek law when two parties that couldn't reconcile their differences approached either a king or a tribal elder, uh, in other words, a third party, to settle the dispute. And this was handled fairly informally. 
Arbitration was a much used part of the judicial machinery and process in the classical period. It was probably a means to reduce the workload of the courts. In other words, to stop them getting bogged down with all manner of cases, particularly in the fourth century BC, when litigation increased so dramatically. By the classical period, arbitration was a formal process and it was governed by law. There were both private and public arbitrators, the public ones being appointed by the state. Public arbitration was seen as a civic duty and all males in their 60th year, in other words, in the, at the age of 59, were required by law to serve as arbitrators. Therefore, just as it was expected that ordinary citizen males would attend the assembly or be a juror, so the same citizens were expected to serve as public arbitrators when they became old enough. In fact, expected is really the wrong verb here. An Athenian citizen need not necessarily attend the assembly or be a juror. These would be the passive citizens who didn't take part in political life. But notice under Athenian law at age 59, you had to be uh, a public arbitrator. There's no wriggling out of it, um, uh, except in special circumstances that I'll talk about in a second. There are significant differences between private and public arbitration. In a private arbitration, both sides had to agree as to who the arbitrator was going to be. Both sides had to state what the dispute was about and that they would accept the arbitrator's verdict. And the arbitrator had to accept and swear that he would arbitrate in a fair and just manner. This was something akin to the juror's oath. Probably settling on an arbitrator who was agreeable to both parties was the biggest hurdle. Say, if you wanted to use one of your friends or a family member who would obviously be biased towards you, that person would clearly be unacceptable to the other party. So that's probably why we know that the state sometimes appointed arbitrators, presumably impartial men who had no connections with either of the disputants. In a private arbitration, the theory was that both parties accepted the arbitrator's verdict because both had agreed in advance on who the person was going to be. However, if after a public arbitration, one of the disputants didn't accept the verdict, he had the right to appeal to it. Uh, if he chose to, dis, uh, to do so, he had recourse to several avenues. First, he could accuse the arbitrator of bias against him. Um, this involved summoning a meeting of all the arbitrators appointed for the year and bringing a charge that I mentioned earlier on of ace angelia against the arbitrator in question. Now, ace angelia is a procedure that's normally translated as impeachment. If the board of arbitrators decided that the arbitrator in question was corrupt, the penalty, or otherwise known as an atimia, uh, was the loss of citizenship rights. Okay. Uh, when this happened, the accused arbitrator did have the right of appeal himself, but obviously since he could suffer the loss of citizenship rights, it was very much in his favor to avoid bias. A second alternative was for someone who felt aggrieved to apply for the case to go to a formal law court. When that happened, the evidence from the arbitration was sealed until the trial. It was sealed in two urns, one for the prosecution and one for the defense. And what is more, only the evidence from the arbitration could be used in the trial. Nothing extra could be introduced after the original arbitration. The arbitration itself took place in a public place where anyone could go along and listen. Both sides put forward their cases and the arbitrator tried to get both parties to agree to a compromise while the hearing took place. If he couldn't do this for some reason, then, the, then he fixed a day when he would make his decision. And on that day, he gave his verdict. Some arbitrators were what we were called tribal judges. Uh, four were elected from each of the 10 tribes that had been created by Cleisthenes in 508. These tribal judges decided private cases brought by members of their tribe. If the amount involved was less than 10 drachmas, the tribal judge settled the matter himself. If the amount was more than 10 drachmas, then a public arbitrator was brought in. This public arbitrator would make his decision, he would report it to the tribal judges, and then in the process he would take his one drachma of payment and notice that that is twice as much as the payment for a juryman. Arbitration was seen as a convenient way of settling dispute out of court, especially for those who might feel intimidated facing a large jury and having to argue a case before it. 
This is an important point. There were no professional lawyers in classical Athens, and individuals had to prepare their cases as well as appear on behalf of themselves in court. Juries were also large, usually of several hundred citizens, and not everyone had the self-confidence or especially the legal know-how to appear before such a large audience. It seems that the vast majority of private disputes never made it to a court of law, however, and therefore arbitration was meant to reduce the workload of the courts, to stop them getting bogged down with all sorts of cases from the most trivial to the most extreme. Also, as I've said, public arbitration was a civic duty, and that is why all citizens in their 60th year had to serve as arbitrators, and the, they could only get out of serving for that year if they happened to be holding another office at the time, uh, or if they were out of the city on business. Apart from the age requirement, though, the similarity with our jury service, and especially the reasons we're trying to wriggle out of it, seem rather obvious, don't they? Um, I don't know if any of you have, um, have been on jury duty. Uh, I had never have. I have, I have been called to serve on jury duty several times, and I always really wanted to be part of it, but I always got uh, deselected for some reason. Um, I remember in particular, there was one case where I, it was for federal court, and it was this really interesting sounding case. It was a bunch of, um, it was like some kind of drug gang from the Bronx, and they were, it involved weapons charges and, um, uh, and all sorts of, uh, you know, violent, uh, you know, I don't know, extortion, racketeering, it's, and it would have gone on for weeks. And of course, you know, you get uh, your job has to continue to pay you for it. So um, I thought that was great. I would have really loved to have been on it, but then it didn't take me. So <laughs> I don't know why that is. I've heard it's because they don't really want people who are um, well educated, that actually they, they prefer people who are kind of uh, of a lesser degree of education, perhaps because they can kind of, I don't know, bedazzle them with their rhetorical sleight of hands. I don't, I don't really know. I don't, I don't fully understand it myself. But uh, whatever the case may be, I've still not, you know, still yet to, to serve on a jury. Um, well, now I think let us move on to, uh, to the next part of things uh, for the judicial process, I, wherein I want to discuss some of the public and private cases and procedures of the legal system. I also want to talk about the preliminaries of the trial, including witness testimony. And we will discuss a special group of people that, oddly to us, were part of the judicial process as well, and they were called sycophants. And, but that we're going to learn that that word does not mean what you think it means. It has come over into modern English, meaning something quite different than what it actually meant in ancient times. Um, and uh, basically, we've been seeing so far that the role of the people when it comes to prosecuting or defending is far more hands-on than it is today in America or the Western world, because classical Athens didn't have any equivalent of the modern day attorney, and that is true. But I, I am going to argue now that there's uh, enough in the classical legal system to see in it the origins for the modern lawyer as well. And uh, I'll try to make that case. So if you're following along with the notes, this would now be on the third page. Um, let's begin with the different types of cases. A private case was called a dike idea, okay, or idea. And uh, a public case was called a dike demosia. The former, the dike idea, picks up on the word idios, which means one's own, okay? In fact, if you, if you hear the word, uh, well, in that word, you can hear, the, hear the, our modern English word idiomatic, okay? Uh, when something is idiomatic, it means, um, uh, you know, it, fo it follows its own rule. It's kind of a thing unto itself. It's an idiom. You can't really translate it, you know, literally into English. But even so, the word idiot is actually in there too. And idiotes is an ancient Greek word. And what it meant was really somebody who kind of stays to themselves and lives their own life and who doesn't really get involved with anyone else. St. Paul even uses this word in his second epistle to the Corinthians, where he tells the Christians in Corinth, um, that uh, you know, if they're speaking in in, uh, in a language that, uh, let's say, an idiotes walks into the church and can't understand what they're saying, he won't know when to uh, when to say his amen. Uh, so it just really meant somebody who kind of does their own thing. It has come to mean idiot in our modern sense of the term only in much more recent times. But anyway, so DK idea uh, is is kind of is a private or one's own suit. The the other one, the DK demosia, picks up on the word demos. You can hear that 
as in the word democracy, the community, the people as a whole. A private case clearly affected a smaller number of disputants and a charge had to be made by one of those affected against somebody else. However, a public case affected the state as a whole and any adult male citizen could bring a suit against the alleged criminal. Public cases included obviously treason or embezzlement of public funds since these affected the running of the city the most. However, there were crimes that were considered offensive against the people as a whole, against the community, which we might not consider in the same way. And these included adultery, something we've talked about already, uh, hubris, which we'll talk about later, and the maltreatment of an orphan. Well, before too long, a private case was identified simply by the word DK, and a public case came to be identified with the word graphe. Now, you remember, this word graphe from the Greek word grapho simply means writing. And it perhaps originally um, meant the charge um, because it was, a, it was a more serious charge that affected the community, it had to be made in writing. So that seems to be the origin of that term. Um, by the 380s BC, that is in the early fourth century, everything was in writing. And um, uh, that was the time when there was a change from oral to written testimony in the law courts. And this type of testimony, like de deposition statements or statements of character by witnesses, would be read out by a clerk of the court during the actual trial. Um, although cases were generally divided into, as I said, DK, private and public graphe ones, the line between each one was not always clear cut. And some crimes fell into categories that strike us as odd. Uh, as rather uh, rather odd today. For example, premeditated homicide was tried under the DK Fonu procedure, a private suit, whereas adultery or passing off illegitimate children as legitimate Athenians was tried under the Grafe Xenias procedure, which was a public suit. This was a charge um, that uh, uh, that we've talked about before, actually, in our in our last class. In a DK uh, that is a private suit, the wronged party simply brought a suit against the alleged criminal. This could be settled either by the arbitration process, as we described uh, earlier tonight, or by a trial if the arbitration process was not acceptable or either side didn't want to use it. The jury in private trials numbered from 201 to 501, depending on the type of crime or the monetary amount involved. And the penalties varied, again, depending on the crime, especially if money was involved. Usually a fine was the normal penalty, but obviously in more serious DK cases like homicide, the penalty would be greater. Execution for premeditated homicide, for example, uh, or sometimes for other crimes, it could be banishment. A graffe was a much more serious matter because it affected the state, as we said. If a citizen wanted to charge a person with a graffe, then he had to use one of several procedures to initiate the case. And again, the procedure used depended on the nature of the charge. Some of the more regularly used procedures were what is known as, the, I'm gonna say a lot of weird Greek words now, an apagoge, an ephegesis, an endexis, apographe, phasis, esengelia, or uh, probole. And I'll explain what each one of these seven procedures is, um, really quite a mouthful <laughs> right now. In the first of them, the apagoge, a prosecutor himself arrested the accused person and led him straight off to prison. Here at the prison, the 11, remember those elected individuals who were in charge of the jail and of the prisoners in it, would then ensure that the accused did not flee. As we said before, the 11 are an enigmatic body. No one really knows exactly when they were introduced or indeed why they numbered 11. It's not quite right to describe the 11 as a type of police force, although that is the job that they kind of did. Um, but they had other functions in the legal system as well, including the oversight of prisoners and also handing over condemned men to the executioner. The procedure called apagoge was somewhat similar to the citizen's arrest of today. Uh, but what if the victim was too intimidated to try to arrest someone else? Then the person could resort to the second procedure that I mentioned, the ephegesis, whereby a prosecutor, the victim, took the appropriate magistrate to the accused man and had that man arrested by the magistrates. 
Then there's the third one I mentioned. That is the endexis procedure. Here, the prosecutor accused someone before the appropriate magistrate, and then the accuser had the option of arresting the, offend, the defendant. You can see there's not a lot of difference here um, uh, between these various procedures, but there are subtle differences. Uh, and, and the Greeks are given to those kind of subtle differences. Now to the apographe and the facis procedures, uh, I'll just kind of run those two together because they're so similar. These were used when someone was accused of still owning property that belonged to the state. In other words, if someone had been found guilty on a previous charge and had to hand over property to the state in the form of a fine, for example, but he hadn't done so, then he could be brought up on charges. Apographe and facis. If successful, the accuser, the man who brought up the debtor on these charges, um, a man such as this would get 75% of what the man was supposed to have paid under the apographe procedure. Um, uh, uh, and, if, and he would get 50% under the FASIS procedure. It is unclear why one procedure was worth less than the other. Uh, I'm sure if you were um, that man in your, if you had that man in your crosshairs um, and uh, he had not surrendered the property to the state, you'd probably want to go get the apographe and get the 75% <clears throat> rather than just 50%. I don't know the answer, but uh, it is possible that the type of property decided the procedure. Who knows? Let's move on to the next procedure. That is the ace engalia. This was more of a political charge. It's usually, as I said before, translated as impeachment and was often brought against officials suspected of corruption. These could be officials elected to a regular uh, political office like the archonships or arbitrators or something else. The procedure the, of Esengalia was not just aimed at those holding constitutional offices, however, it was also used against people who had maltreated orphans. Hence, when we use the term impeachment, we think of it in that narrower political sense as we do today, uh, where we talk, for example, of the impeachment of a president. But the Athenians didn't have this narrow political sense of the word, that you could impeach people for other things too. Another translation that is often used of Esengalia is simply denunciation. And this may convey the meaning a little bit more clearly to us than impeachment. Our final procedure is the probole. Uh, and a probole was a case that was first heard in the assembly. And then if the assembly thought that the charge was justified, it referred the case to a law court. In other words, the probole was, a, was like a preliminary verdict that was decided by the assembly. It was preliminary in the sense that it wasn't the final one that was issued only by the court if the case got that far. There's a rather famous example of a case dating from 348 when Demosthenes, the famous orator, was punched in the face by a man named Medius at a religious festival. Um, under Athenian law, this conduct at a religious gathering was totally illegal. It would have offended the gods, and you, you, know, you don't get into fisticuffs whenever the gods were involved. So Demosthenes brought, brought a probole against Medius, and we actually have Demosthenes' ultra-lengthy prosecution speech from the trial. It's one of the very few forensic speeches that have survived from Athens. Um, uh, we have a lot of them, but we don't have a huge amount. Um, it's important to remember that nothing was cut in stone when it came to these, uh, this sort of thing. Sometime, sometimes a person's crime might fall under a variety of laws. Uh, for example, some kinds of theft and homicide. Uh, in, the, in the case of theft, a man could be prosecuted under the apagoge or ephegesis procedures, or he could even have a DK brought against him, which was called the D.K. Clopes, the charge of theft. And men accused of being sycophants or blackmailers, and I'm going to talk more about this group in a moment, uh, were tried under the probole procedure. So you can see that the legal system was very fluid, uh, perhaps far more so than it is today for us. Now that I've summarized some of the judicial procedures by which a person might be accused, let's now turn to the litigants. As we know, it was up to a private individual to bring a suit against someone. And for those individuals who speak on, on their own behalf in court, if the case that got, for, got that far, uh, the prosecutor might be the, might be the wronged person himself. 
or <coughs> excuse me, under Solon's law of third party intervention, he might be a volunteer prosecutor. In other words, a person who accused someone on behalf of the victim. There were occasions when a person could not indict someone during the year. In certain cases, couldn't be started except at specific times. These included homicide suits, and uh, I'll just expand on that right now. Whereas today, someone can be accused of murder at, at any time. In classical Athens, a homicide suit could only be brought in the first seven months of the Athenian year. Remember, the Athenian year lasted for 10 months. Each month was about six weeks long. Why could you only prosecute someone for homicide in the first seven months of the year and not the remaining three? Well, this was because the whole suit from its inception to the actual trial could take up to four months with uh, evidence, witness testimony, finding out all sorts of things. This was a capital charge after all. And homicide was obviously very serious uh, as a crime involving capital punishment. Therefore, it was thought that the same magistrate who oversaw the start of the homicide case should see it through, but that same magistrate would be unable to do this if the procedure started during those last three months of his office. Um, once that attic year came to an end, a new magistrate would take over. We know so little about law elsewhere, it's hard to know if this was similar to other places. It's often frustrating. However, we do know that in Sparta, capital cases took several days to be decided because the decision to condemn once it had been carried out couldn't be reversed as in non-capital cases. The Athenians evidently thought about this as well. They realized the implications of finding somebody guilty on a capital charge and executing that person. You can bring somebody back from exile, but you can't bring them back from the dead. So the, the same person who brought the indictment to the magistrate on the right day also had to ensure that the accused person would turn up in that same day. If the crime was a public one and he was game enough to go in for an apoge, apagoge, that is to lead the person away himself, the accuser issued an oral summons to the person along the lines of, I summon you to appear before magistrate such and such on this particular day. And he would be accompanied by at least two people as witnesses. That way the accused couldn't say, I didn't know he never came and told me when I was supposed to turn up. When the day for the first hearing arrived, the person bringing the charge made a statement of his claim to the magistrate, which from about 380 BC on was in writing, and he paid a fee to initiate the procedures. Uh, we've already talked about the judicial powers of the magistrates from archons to the state appointed or public sunergoroi. Um, and we talked about how some of these were akin to public prosecutors as we think of them today. Included among these prosecutors was another group that is best dealt with at this point in the lecture, and that were the, the, the oh, that was the sycophants. Now, in a nutshell, these sycophants were blackmailers. They were men who would spy on others and then threaten to take them to court unless you paid them off, okay? So sycophant obviously has a very different meaning in modern day English. When we think of a sycophant nowadays, we think of like a teacher's pet or a flatterer or a toady or something like that. Uh, but that is definitely not what is going on here. Some crimes and procedures obviously appeal to sycophants such as the apografe procedure by which the accuser got 75% of the convicted man's property or the fossis procedure by which the accuser got 50%. The sycophants as a group probably arose out of Solon's volunteer prosecutors. In other words, the third party intervention that we talked about. And they became notorious as the fifth century BC wore on. And especially in the fourth century, uh, I'm sorry, they grew notorious as the fifth century wore on and became especially so in the fourth century. It seems that many sycophants prosecuted just for the sake of it, even if the misdeed wasn't very great. Uh, of course, we all commit crimes, right? Uh, as if, we, if, you, if you drive, if you have a license, how many of us have approached a four-way intersection with no car in sight and uh, haven't come to a complete halt before the stop sign? Um, well, I've certainly done it. I shouldn't be recording this, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, in Athens, if you were spotted doing this and a, and a sycophant saw you doing it, he would be after you like a shot. It didn't matter how minor the crime was or how major. Uh, 
okay? He was kind of like a professional, um, you know, tattletaler. Needless to say, sycophancy was scorned by members of society, and that was probably why a man could be prosecuted for being a sycophant under the probole procedure, uh, the one where the assembly uh, first delivers a preliminary verdict, and then if it thinks the case has merit, it proceeds to a law court. I think sycophants were prosecuted under the probole because of the involvement of the assembly. The sycophant would Come, become the talk of several thousand people in an assembly, not just a few hundred jurors in a law court. And it may have been felt that having the assembly investigate a charge of sycophancy would be a deterrent to help a sycophant's activities in the future. Everybody would know your name. It would be like being one of those sensational newspapers or magazines today, or maybe that's already even a dated reference. It would be like being on, I don't know, getting a lot of views on Instagram or something like that. Well, another effort to curb the practices of sycophants, which might overburden courts if someone called a sycophant's bluff and didn't want to pay him off, was the law that if a prosecutor failed to obtain one-fifth of the votes cast in a trial, or if he abandoned the case after he started it, he was fined 1,000 drachmas. This was a very substantial sum. And it was clearly meant to act as a deterrent. Anyone bringing an Asengalia was not subject to this law, though. Later, the inability to bring this type of case, um, to bring the type of case the prosecutor had abandoned or lost um, by more than four-fifths of the vote was added to the penalty. So the unsuccessful prosecutor might suffer atemia, that is, the loss of his citizenship rights. And this would surely put sycophants off from going after anyone willy-nilly if they had faced uh, those kind of dire consequences. Uh, at least that's what one would presume. At the same time, it is to be noted that the Athenians would have imposed far more severe penalties on sycophancies. A sy sycophancy. Um, I'm sorry, they could have imposed far more severe penalties, but they didn't. And that they didn't makes one wonder whether they were tacitly viewing sycophancy as a sort of necessary evil to check the activities of potential lawbreakers. After all, if someone were planning to break the law and was found out, or if someone had committed a crime and were being blackmailed for it, that meant that the courts wouldn't be involved. It would free up court time for other trials. Presumably the sycophants kept tabs on those they had successfully caught out before. So a person who had been a sycophant's victim in the past was unlikely to do anything criminal again for fear of further blackmail. Uh, this would have some effect on the crime rate, one would think. So perhaps regardless of the scorn heaped on them, the sycophants were perhaps a necessary evil and they were recognized as that. Now, as we've already said, a victim could accuse someone by a DK if a private matter or, uh, or a, one of several procedures if the matter were public. Some of these procedures involved a magistrate from the outset like Ephegesis and others involved just the person bringing the charge, the apagoge. The accuser had to make his case to the relevant magistrate and if the magistrate decided that the right legal procedure was being followed in the indictment and that any witness testimony was acceptable, he would then set a date for a more formal hearing called an anacrisis, or preliminary inquiry. Uh, this was held in the open air and anyone could observe it, so there were plenty of people around to act as witnesses if one of the disputants tried to wriggle out or something, uh, wriggle out of something later on. Again, we can compare this to the open air hearing that we talked about before in the Shield of Achilles uh, in Homer's Iliad, where the two disputants are before a group of people making their case. At the anacrisis, the charge would be read out and the accuser and the accused would be interrogated by the magistrate. Only after that did the magistrate decide whether the case had merits and that it should proceed to a law court or perhaps arbitration in the case of a private matter. If the case was proceeding to a court, then all the evidence that had been brought out of the, at the anacrisis was sealed into urns, and these would not be opened until the trial proper. And as with arbitration that went to a law court, if someone disputed it, no additional evidence could be introduced 
after the anachronisius. It was during the anachronisius that the person accused could challenge his accuser if he thought he was being prosecuted under the wrong law. And given the multitude of laws and procedures, it was entirely possible that someone might accuse another person under the wrong procedure, either by accident or by design. It was then up to the magistrate to decide whether the prosecutor was going about uh, things the wrong way. But the big question was, what happened if the magistrate didn't know the law well enough? Well, a way to help the magistrate decide the best procedure, which was fairest, which was the right one, was by the use of witnesses. The use of witnesses came in a procedure called the Dia Marturia, and it was introduced in the fifth century BC. A witness who claimed to know the facts of the case or about either of the two disputants made a formal statement under oath and then the magistrate used the statement to decide whether the case should proceed and under what procedure. The big question, of course, here was, what if a witness lied? Well, as a deterrent to this, the other party could bring a DK against the witness under a procedure called pseudomartyrion. Okay, pseudo, obviously the word for false, and pseudomartyrion would be translated as bearing false witness, giving false evidence. And so the charge will be brought under the DK Pseudo-Martyrion. And uh, interestingly, if you keep hearing this word martyr here, the Martyrion, this is the, that is the origin of the word martyr. The word martyr means a witness. Uh, this is, of course, the term that Christians since ancient times called those who bore witness to their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ before persecutors, then as now, in human history and, uh, and, and would die for their faith, would seal their testimony with their own blood. Um, the case would then go to law court and if found guilty, the witness or witnesses suffered atimia, loss of citizenship rights. So lying was a gamble and it could really come back to bite you. While the Dia Martoria was being decided by a court, the original case was put on hold. And when the Dia Mataria had been settled, the original case would continue. But, of course, if your witness or witnesses had been found guilty of giving false testimony, that would seriously detrimentally have affected the validity of your case. Um, and at the end of the 5th century BC, the Dia Mataria was replaced by the Paragrafe procedure, which we've talked about before. Um, the para, uh, as a result of the paragraphe at the initial hearing, the accused man who thought that his prosecutor was charging him falsely or charging him under the wrong procedure brought a countersuit against the prosecutor. When that happened, once again, the original case was put on hold while the paragraphe was decided by a court. Of course, what's happened now is that the defendant in the original case has become the prosecutor in the paragraphe of the new case since he is indicting the original prosecutor. If he won his paragraphe, the original prosecutor had his case dismissed and he lost one sixth of his property. We can imagine that the process of private individuals prosecuting someone or defending themselves would have been intimidating for many people given the hundreds that could make up a jury. Presumably, if people were intimidated about talking before their peers in the assembly, uh, they would be in this. In, they would also be intimidated in the court of law. We should also question how much the ordinary person would know about the points of law. If a person going to an assembly could not be expected to be an expert and to expertly evaluate whether it was a good idea to send most of Athens' fleet to Sicily, as we've talked about before, then that same person was very unlikely to know the ins and outs of the law. I said before that men of the fourth century BC especially were fairly knowledgeable about current events. There was a lot of street talk going on in Athens then as now. But talking about current events is very different from knowing about the finer points of law, right? It doesn't cost anything to have an opinion about something, but real knowledge of something is quite different. Just look at Twitter. Uh, and that's why we rise, uh, we see the rise in the fourth century BC of a group of people known as logographoi or professional speech writers. These men, for a fee of course, would write the prosecution speech or the defense speech for a client. The logographoi probably also had expertise in law, 
so that when a private individual consulted a logographos to write a speech for a particular case, that logographos could also advise on matters of law. So as long as the person had the money, he might not need to prepare his own case. He might be able to leave it to a logographos to do this for him. The litigants can also call on supporting speakers. Uh, these were called sunegoroi, uh, <clears throat> to speak on their behalf in court. Such people would routinely be family members or friends. Uh, in other words, this recourse uh, would be especially helpful if the main speaker, that is the prosecutor or the defendant, was not himself a great speaker. He was a bit intimidated or something. And after all, everything depended on convincing the jury. So performance mattered as much as content and something that we'll pick up on after the break in a moment. Incidentally, uh, note that the same term sunegaroi was used for the public prosecutors that we already talked about recently. So it's the context that determined whether the person was a character witness of a prosecutor or whether he was a public prosecutor himself appointed by the state. Logography, logographia, the writing of speeches for others, was probably a steady and lucrative business given that Athens was a litigious society. However, the logographos had to be good. Otherwise no one would hire him if his speeches kept losing cases. Um, I have a personal opinion about this. Um, I see in the formal class of logographoi, who the people, the men who charged fees for their legal and expert uh, write, legal writing. And then in the more informal group of sunegoroi who spoke on your behalf, I see here the origins of the modern lawyer. That is someone who for a fee, a big fee, prepares a case from start to finish and speaks on his or her client's behalf. If court, in court if need be. If successful, he or she can build up a large and powerful law firm and perhaps even attract media attention if the right cases keep coming along, just like nowadays. The same was true in Athens, except there, of course, there were no law firms as such, but you get my point, I think. There were a number of high profile trials, uh, trials and many logographoi would have shot to fame and fortune because of them. Uh, some also use their reputation as speechwriters to enter the political arena, and we will be learning about one uh, named Demosthenes, the greatest orator of all Greece. So now that we have a basic understanding of the judicial machinery and process, we can now turn to what happened at the actual trial. And uh, all that remains for me to say then is that uh, after, the, after the break, um, I'll see you all in court. <laughs> so uh, let's do this. Let's uh, pause. So having covered the aspects of the judicial system, such as its machinery and its process, uh, we have, uh, which, which we have set up for this kind of final portion of our theme of law. Um, what, what is left for us is to kind of look at the actual trial day and what that would have entailed. So, what happened when a case went to trial? Well, what was required? Um, well, we should look at that as well. What, was the, what were the requirements on the part of the litigants? What sorts of arguments were used to sway the jury? Uh, how did the jury vote? How long did a trial last? What are some of the striking differences between classical trials and those of today? Those are all sorts of questions that are important to ask, and we're going to try to take them up as we kind of and sort of build around them in this final portion of the lecture. So to begin with, a number of trials would be heard on the days when the courts met, which were about two thirds of the year or so. The jurors would not know in advance which trial they were hearing until they were assigned to an actual court. The jurors to be arrived at the court complexes very early in the morning around daybreak and then underwent a multi-stage selection process. Included in this process were tokens or markers that had the name of a different juror on each of them. And they were put into an allotment machine called a cleroterion and the tokens were arbitrarily selected so that no one knew which juror's name would come out of, uh, out of the lot and uh, which one would not. This is a bit like uh, the numbers on, on balls and lottery draws, basically. And the process must have taken some time and those men who were not selected for the day would simply go home and would try again for the next day. 
Having been assigned to their courts, the jurors then sat through some administrative proceedings, such as selecting one person to be in charge of the water clock, the clepsydra that we talked about before, which measured the length of speeches. Uh, they also selected four persons who were responsible for the ballot urns uh, into which the jurors cast their votes. And they probably also finalized details uh, to do with their payment at the end of the trial day. When all these sorts of things were over and done with, the trial proper began. The trial was divided into three stages, and the term usually applied to the whole process is the tripartite day, or the measured out day, as it's often translated, a term that refers to the water that timed court speeches and was measured literally out by the water clock. Well, the first third of the day was given over to the prosecution's case the second third to the defense's case. And then if the defendant were found guilty, in many cases, he could propose an alternative penalty. The third, the final third of the, of the day was given over to speeches about that penalty. And the speakers had the same amount of time, and this was strictly controlled by the clepsydra, the, by the water clock. Um, it, it consisted of a number of, uh, this clock that is, consists of a number of urns holding a, um, certain amount of water, and each urn had a hole at the bottom closed off by a kind of plug. One full urn was placed on a short pedestal above the empty one, and then the plug was removed, and when the water flowed into the empty one, the full one was replaced. This procedure was then repeated to coincide with uh, the measurements out of the day. Uh, actually, uh, one of these clepsydra was, was discovered in the Agora of Athens, and when one sees how, how long it took to empty and to compare this to the number of urns uh, that we hear about in some of the forensic speeches, scholars have estimated that <clears throat> in a public trial, and there would only be one public trial per day, the trial day lasted about six and a half hours. And therefore, each third of the day lasted about uh, two hours and 10 minutes or so. The water clock was not stopped for the quoting of supporting evidence such as laws or oracles or decrees in public trials. The water clock was only stopped in private suits when evidence was quoted. And this meant that in a public suit, you had to time your speech very closely, especially if you wanted to include all sorts of supporting evidence. And we have a number of forensic speeches with references to them in them to lines like, gentlemen of the jury, I could tell you more, but I see the water is against me. Or... At the end of a speech, there is a reference to handing over the water to another prosecutor. These references refer to the water clock and the amount of time available or not available. The jurors then voted at the end of the defense speech, so the second third of the day. Each juror was given one bronze disc with a solid axle through the center and one bronze disc with a uh, hollow axle through the center. The solid axle was to acquit the defendant and the hollow axle was to convict him. The jurors as one uh, cast one of these ballots, the one they wanted to be counted into a bronze urn, and they discarded the other ballot, the one that they didn't want to be counted into a wooden urn. Presumably they kept their thumb and finger over the ends of the axle so that the people standing next to them couldn't see how they were voting. Um, <clears throat> the ballots in the bronze urn were then emptied out onto a board and they were counted and the defendant was either acquitted or accused, found guilty that is, um, depending on the number of solid or hollow axle ballots that had been cast. If the jurors declared the defendant innocent, they drew their pay and went home. Uh, if, it was, if it was the end of the day, they would uh, then lis listen to another private suit if not, uh, as did the defendant. If they found the defendant guilty, and there was the option of a speech to suggest an alternative penalty, the jurors returned to their seats. The Athenian constitution says that they stood to cast their votes. So presumably they stayed standing while the ballots were counted. Otherwise they would have had to have returned to their seats and then gotten up again if the defendant were acquitted. Once they were settled again, the jurors sat through the final third of the tripartite day to hear speeches about the penalty. Both the prosecutor and the defendant put forward alternate penalties. If a guilty party were going to be punished by exile, for example, he might try to commute his sentence somewhat by asking to return after a certain number of years uh, 
or perhaps asking that his property not be confiscated by the state, but that his family might retain control of it. The most famous alternative penalty is, of course, that presented by Socrates in 399. If you've read Socrates' defense speech as, as um, rendered by Plato, um, he, uh, you know, he's the, the penalty put against him was death, and he put forward a, an alternative penalty of, um, uh, well, perhaps I should explain more detail in case you're not familiar with the whole, the whole story. Socrates was put on trial in the year 399 on trumped up charges of impiety and corrupting the youth, and we've mentioned that already tonight. Um, the charges, although they were concocted, were serious ones, and he was found guilty and sentenced to death. And the jurors at his trial knew that it was a political scheme, and so did Socrates. Uh, we've talked already about the Crito in a previous lecture, actually, where Crito visited Socrates in prison on the eve of the execution and urged Socrates to escape. And he would be safe living elsewhere, says Crito, and the Athenians would have breathed a sigh of relief to get him out of, uh, out of their hair because that's all they wanted to do was to get rid of him. But Socrates refused, and he drank the hemlock the next day and died. And since everyone at the trial knew Socrates was a victim really, a victim of political charges, the jurors would probably have been prepared to adopt a lesser penalty, such as Socrates proposed, um, such as he, Socrates might have proposed, or a more normal person would have proposed, such as that he moved into exile, that he leave Attica. But instead, a scornful and defiant Socrates stood up before the jury and proposed that as an alternative penalty, as an alternative to him being executed, he should be fed at state expense for the rest of his life. Uh, this actually, uh, in, to be given free meals in the Pritonion, this one of this public building in Athens. What he actually was suggesting by doing this was the highest civic honor that could have been given to any member of Athens. It was only given, for instance, to people who had done some great service to the city, Olympic victors and, you know, stuff like that. So this obviously would have been a, a real kind of mockery of, of, of the seriousness of the charge. And, uh, and uh, the, of course it was rejected and he drank the hemlock. Now returning to the point at hand, where the law formally prescribed a penalty, that def the defendant could not of course propose an alternative one. Premeditated homicide, for example, carried the death penalty and there was no wriggling out of that one. Uh, those sentenced to death faced execution by one of three ways. Uh, there was a pit or a chasm into which the condemned man was thrown either to die from the fall or starvation from being left there. The second one was the board on which the guilty person was shackled by iron rings around his neck, wrists, and ankles, and he was left either out to die from exposure or the iron collar around his neck gradually strangled him. And finally, there was the drinking of hemlock, as Socrates chose. Exile was another penalty for major crimes, and those who were punished with death or exile also had their property confiscated by the state. Sometimes even their families and descendants were disenfranchised, that is, uh, they lost their civic rights. And, um, and that is what I mean when I say that someone sentenced to exile might plead that his property not be confiscated. He might plead that his family might continue to live in the house or retain ownership of it because it was such a, a, a burdensome punishment. The Athenian constitution tells us that trials were over and done with in a day. In fact, it says that four, court, uh, four private ones were heard by one court and one public one was heard by another. And that made the procedure, I think, very rushed, especially given time limits that included the quoting of evidence. This is very different from today, of course, when we have trials that stretch on for months in a major public case, years even. Also, normally, when the defendant was guilty, the punishment was carried out the next day, and this included execution. So there's no such thing in classical Athens as a long-term death row. There was no filing of multiple stays of execution or appeals to have death sentences commuted on grounds that the method of execution was cruel or unconstitutional. However, I personally wonder um, whether high-profile public cases could be dealt with in a single day. I think that in some cases, the trial could extend overnight and into the next day. And as I said, this is one of, um, you know, this is my own personal kind of wondering about it. I, not everyone would, would, would agree with this, but let's think about cases where we have multiple prosecutors and very long speeches. 
For example, in 323 BC, Demosthenes, the orator, was put on trial for treason. And this was a trumped up charge, as had been the one against Socrates. But Demosthenes was a major public figure. If he had been put on trial today, court TV would have had a field day with him. Demosthenes was prosecuted by 10 men, and they were appointed by the state, 10 Sunegoroi, public prosecutors. And we have one fairly extant prosecution speech from his trial, and one speech that is horribly fragmented, but still we might, um, we, we assume we might have a third of it. And the first one, that is the one that's really, uh, that's, that's extant and complete, uh, takes about 30 pages or so of Greek text. And so it couldn't have been uh, given in just a few minutes. Not all of the prosecutors, these 10 Sunegoroi, of course, might have spoken uh, for the same length of time, that's true. Some might have just stood up and said, find him guilty, gentlemen of the jury, and then sat down again. But when we think about 10 prosecution speeches, plus all manner of supporting evidence, it's hard to think about all of that fitting into a two hour and 12 minute limit. Uh, Demosthenes himself would have spoken at length in his defense. Demosthenes was known for his verbosity. Um, here he was, of course, was on trial for treason, so he wasn't going to exactly be terse, would he be? We don't have a speech from the trial, but the prosecution speeches that we do have, those two that I just mentioned, refer to Demosthenes as using character witnesses, and these would have taken up time. And then there's the matter of how long it would have taken the jury to vote and for the ballots to be counted and so on, because the jury at Demosthenes' trial numbered 1,501. Um, so there's all that. Furthermore, in the classical period, a new word comes into existence, dekazdain. Uh, it has a special meaning of large-scale bribery of jurors. Okay? The Greek word deka simply means 10, but dekazdain is a legal term, and here it means 10 in the sense of large scale, or the bribery of, of jurors on a large scale. Now, you don't have a word for something unless that something exists. I guess that's not true, right? Unicorn. <laughs> but let me put it this way. You don't develop a term like that in a legal setting unless something is happening, okay? Um, it would be impossible to bribe the jurors at a regular trial because no one would could predict who would be selected for that day. The selection process was arbitrary. So there was little point trying to bribe anyone unless you bribed all the men turning up at daybreak wanting to be selected for jury duty. But if a trial went into a second day, and that same jury convened on day two, which it would have done, then you had, the, uh, you had that night to uh, bribe the jurors. You see, you could go around to their houses, you could find them. Um, and there's also this ominous line in the Athenian constitution that after the introduction of jury pay in the 450s, corruption began. Clearly corruption, uh, uh, the, what they mean by that is corruption of jurors. The Athenian constitution tells us this. How on earth could you corrupt the jurors when you had such an arbitrary and haphazard selection process? There's something else going on behind the scenes, it seems to me. <clears throat> so the length of a political trial is a very interesting question in many respects, and it shows us, I think, again, just how there's really not so much clear, uh, so little is clear cut in ancient history. Um, you know, when we're talking about ancient societies and how things operated, it's so different really than the studying of modern history where things are given, and there's not so much room for argumentation based on a paucity of evidence. Even the length of the trial here, you could write whole articles about it, and I'm sure people have. Now we'll just move on to the speeches of the prosecution and defense, which were also very different from those of today. We actually, as I mentioned before, have a goodly number of actual forensic speeches that have survived. Uh, we don't have hundreds of them or anything like that, and there must have been thousands that were delivered in the courts over the century and a half or so from Ephialtes down to the abolition of democracy by the Macedonians in 322. Today, though, we only have a handful of them. And um, there's a very good collection if you're interested in reading them. It is uh, uh, translated, of course, uh, in, uh, edited by a man named Chris Carey uh, called Trials from Classical Athens, uh, which I would definitely recommend for you. And he is very, it gives a very good introduction in that book, summarizing the legal system, all the stuff I've been talking about today. Uh, Trials from Classical Athens by Chris Carey. It's a good book to dip into, and I'd recommend it. Well, as I said, he has about two dozen or so 
uh, speeches translated from a variety of suits. Uh, there's speeches on adultery in there, assault and battery, inheritance, slander, business and commerce. Um, it's interesting, by the way, that with the exception of two highly political show trials, all our extant speeches are either the prosecution one or the defense one in a particular case. We, don't, we never have both sides. Uh, we don't have prosecution and defense, except in these two high profile trials that I've mentioned. Perhaps the reason why we only have prosecution or defense in so many private trials or minor public ones, uh, I, I'm sorry, I should say major public ones, is because the ones we do have today were the successful ones. So there was no need, you see, to record and circulate for posterity the speeches that failed. Um, you see, so that's generally how it is believed that, that we have the ones where the guy, if we, if, if we have the speech from where the guy got off, then we will have the defense speech. If we have it where the guy uh, was found guilty, then we will have the prosecution speech. As for the, the two political showpiece trials that I just mentioned, both of them have Demosthenes facing off against his political opponent, Aeschines. Uh, the first time, uh, the first one dates from 343 and the second one from 330. And, um, and I will deal with those trials when we deal with that historical period in our later lectures. Much of the content of the speeches that we have today would have been ruled inadmissible and probably um, have the speaker fined for contempt of court or even disbarred today if he used the same kind of thing. Uh, what I mean by that is slander of opponents was prevalent. Um, indeed, it was enjoyed, right? People liked a good, juicy, um, you know, bit of um, vituperation. Thus, if you call someone a wife beater or a murderer of his parents, a sycophant, uh, perhaps he was a homosexual prostitute when he was a child, all of those kind of accusations are, are common in, uh, in Athenian legal speeches. And um, uh, even if you had no grounds for your, to support your allegation, they could all just be thrown in there. Personal invective was everywhere in these speeches, Patri as were patriotic appeals to Athens's glorious past, especially to uh, the defeat of the Persians or the Trojan War or the persistrated tyranny. Remember, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, but the point, though, to make is that gossip, innuendo, and so on were all part and parcel of a forensic speech, and they were indeed relished by the jurors. Okay, they they, they were really, they wanted to be entertained. They liked to laugh and to and to be uh, you know horrified, uh, just the same way I suppose we all do. Perhaps the worst rhetorical technique is the argument that was introduced by the sophists at the end of the fifth century. That is the argument based on probability. And this was used ad nauseum, okay? I mentioned this earlier, actually, within the context of our discussion on the use of rhetoric, but now we can say a few more things about it here. What I mean by the argument from probability is, for example, if someone were on trial for, let's say, stealing a sheep, and he had done this thing before, then you probably, heavily underline the word probably, he probably was guilty this time. And so he should be found guilty again. So the prosecutor might run a line such as, gentlemen of the jury, we all know this man has been convicted of stealing sheep before. We all know one of my own sheep is missing right now. So there's no question he probably took it and we should find him guilty, end quote. Uh, it is no wonder that Plato, if you... Are, have read some of the works of Plato, you will know that he condemned the argument based on probability in the strongest possible terms. And he pleaded that people should take into account only the facts and the laws and not be swayed by rhetoric, okay? It, he was disregarded, <laughs> of course, because just as rhetoric often ruled the assembly, a great oral performance could mask a weak court case. And so rhetoric ruled the domain of the courts as well. Well, a skillful speaker could also use laws that had no bearing on the case to denigrate an opponent. In 345 BC, for example, the orator Aeschines prosecuted a man named Timarchus uh, under the procedure called the Dokimasia ton Retoron, which means basically scrutiny of public speakers. So anyone who spoke in the assembly. Timarchus was a speaker in the assembly, a politician, and he was also an opponent of Aeschines. Speakers as personal lives were an item of concern for the Athenians, as we've seen many times. And so Aeschines took advantage of the fact that Timarchus was a male prostitute, and he prosecuted Timarchus on those very grounds of male prostitution. 
this sort of job was especially scorned by the Athenians because it basically it put the male into the passive role. And um, uh, that was viewed by them as not only being unnatural, but unmanly. Aeschines, for, for a grown man to be in, in that kind of position. Aeschines' charge was a political one uh, against an opponent, but you see, he's not really talking about the issue here so much. He's lending weight to his case. Um, uh, yes, he did invoke the laws and, uh, and all that, um, but, uh, and he does invoke laws that actually have nothing to do with the political charges that he's leveling, laws like protecting children and stuff like that, regulating the conduct in schools and the gymnasium and so on. Um, but he's doing it, he's kind of, he's slandering his, his opponent, okay? He's, he's making a, you know, kind of denigrating his opponent. And this is just the sort of thing that would be thrown out of court today for lack of relevance uh, or for being unduly prejudicial. But the jurors at Tamarcus's trial lapped it up because they, we know that he, they found him guilty. It was also common for defendants to parade their wives and children through court, crying and gnashing their teeth in an attempt to gain the sympathy of the jurors. Socrates at his trial in 399 makes a point of saying that he's not going to do that. He's not going to be like other litigants because he will not resort to that practice. But Socrates was clearly, he's sort of the exception that proves, proves the rule. He was a minority. And this parading of children and wives gave rise to people actually hiring out their own children and, and perhaps their wife too, for other defendants to bring in a whole tribe of people um, uh, before the jury and say, look, I have all these kids. Would you, would you really want to do this to my unfortunate wife and all those children? I guess they wouldn't have brought they couldn't have hired out the wife too because then you would have two wives and that's that that Athenian law didn't allow that so yes it would just be just be the children really another difference between then and now given the large size of juries which as I keep mentioning could run into the quadruple digits was the noise level and the ability to hear properly we've mentioned this already in the context of an assembly meeting attended by several thousand citizens, but the courts were no different in terms of being able to hear what went on. Today, a jury sits quietly. If there's any noise in the courtroom, the, the judge bangs his gavel to restore order and everybody can hear properly again. And if a person keeps making a big to-do, they can be hauled out of there by the bailiff. Uh, well, those jurors who were sitting further away from the speakers, uh, well, there was nothing like that. Back then <clears throat> in ancient Athens, it was very noisy, very boisterous. For one thing, in, as in the assembly, there was no PA system, no public address system to allow a large audience to hear a speaker clearly. Those jurors who were sitting further away from the speakers simply couldn't hear as clearly as those who were sitting closer. Moreover, some might be chatting amongst themselves, perhaps asking the person sitting next to them what a speaker just said. Some got distracted in other ways, such as eating. We know that these procedures went on all day, so people brought their own lunches. So you have somebody sitting there munching on his gyro or whatever, uh, watching the birds fly overhead. Who knows? Um, <clears throat> remember, the courts were open roofs, so you would have all sorts of external noises going on around you. Uh, how on earth would you be able to hear one of the prosecution speeches against, say, Demosthenes, or indeed even Demosthenes' own defense speech in 323, <coughs> when you were sitting among 1,501 jurors, and you might be sitting some distance from those who were speaking next to some chatty neighbor, it would have been very hard to hear what's going on. And um, speakers didn't stop if jurors got distracted. I actually believe today that a member of a modern jury can actually stop the proceedings and ask a question during a case, uh, perhaps for a point of clarification. But back then, if the jury wanted to talk amongst themselves, it simply lost track of what the speakers were saying. They didn't stop. Um, and that meant that by the time you'd ask the person sitting next to you, hey, what the heck did he just say? I missed it. Uh, and, you, and by the time you got your reply, if there, if there was one, the speaker was already well onto his next other subject. And that meant that both you and the guy next to you had lost track of what was going on. Prosecution and defense had to be very careful, therefore, to make sure that the jurors didn't become too confused or indeed too annoyed from speeches, the content of which they couldn't hear, because then the jury might react adversely against the speaker. And that's the very last thing somebody wanted to have happen. <clears throat> 
That's perhaps why speakers encourage the jurors, the jurors to shout, applaud, or cheer at certain times. There was actually a rhetorical term for this called a thorobos, a Greek word that simply means the uproar. The court seemed to have been something like kind of a, I don't know, uh, you, <laughs> I don't want to make it sound too, too uh, outrageous, but kind of like a, almost like a, you know, a public, uh, like a concert or something like that, with the audience being encouraged to cheer when the hero walks on stage and boo when the villain, uh, villain appears. And everyone likes doing this, even if we've lost our place in the plot for a few moments. It's hardly a surprise then that, our, that the anti-hero in Aristophanes' Wasps says that he enjoys being a juror for the entertainment value. Perhaps somewhat similar to today, though handled differently, is the sense of dramatic immediacy in the speeches that we have, because speakers will often address the jurors directly, and they will challenge them to find a defendant guilty. Or if it's a defendant speaking, he will challenge the jurors to find him innocent. The speakers make it seem like the jury is on trial. They might run a line such as, if you acquit him, gentlemen of the jury, what will you say to your wife and your family when you go home? Or they might say, although you're judging this man, gentlemen of the jury, the whole of the city, indeed the whole of Greece is judging you. Today, attorneys in court look at jurors when they make their opening and closing statements or when closing those on the stand, of course, or questioning those on the stand. And remember in classical Athens, there was no cross-examination. And attorneys today might try to work on the jury's emotions before the judge intervenes. Um, However, this is very different from how speakers would have whip up the jury in classical Athens. They really did encourage them to yell, shout, applaud, and take part in the case. To us then, the Athenian court system still seems very amateurish and like going to a theater. Yet having said that, jurors took their dicastic oath seriously, and we discussed this at some length in our previous lecture. And the people as a whole recognized the importance of law in the city and how the safety of the city rested on its laws. Um, you remember that phrase, isonomia, equality before the law. Well, classical, the classical judicial system of Athens shouldn't really be called inferior to ours because, well, we really should just talk about it merely being different. We should recognize that without it, we wouldn't enjoy the rights and privileges and the recourse to law and appeal that we take for granted nowadays. And I mentioned before that the fourth century BC was one of great change for the Greek world. And in our next lectures, we are going to return to what brought about that change. We're now kind of putting an end to <clears throat> basically the entire legal uh, discussion tonight. And we're going to now turn to our last portion of our course in the coming lectures. And that is the changes that occurred under Macedonia. First under Philip II, who was king from 359 to 336, and then under his son Alexander the Great, who was king from 336 to 323. Indeed, we have no choice but to turn to Macedonia now, because while we've been discussing the sorts of legal changes in cases that were taking place in the later fourth century, Macedonia was already started uh, on its encroach, en encroachment on Greek autonomy. And it is to those topics that we will spend uh, our time uh, next week, okay, beginning looking at next week.